I welcome you to the Arima Seventh-day Adventist Church. We are situated at number 19 Degan Street, Arima in Trinidad. And today, we are welcoming you to our virtual as well as our live worship service. God bless you as you I enjoy this experience here at Arima Seventh-day Adventist Church, a place you can go. Good night to our online viewers and to our home audience here. Um, it's once a time again to pray. I will invite you now to humbly bow your heads as we lift up a word unto the Lord. Oh, Heavenly Father, we want to give you thanks and praise for all the blessings that you have given us today. We just want you to be with us, O oh Lord Father, as we go through the procedures of tonight. Be with the speaker. Be with the ones who have to be on the technical team. Oh, Father, let your presence just be in this house. Let the message go out, oh, Father. And we pray that all hearts will be touched by this message and your word, oh, God, will penetrate deep into the hearts of, and minds of families as we lift up your manservant again tonight. We ask that your word will be put into his mouth and we, O oh Lord, will hear and we will be obedient to whatever is being said to us because we need at this time to fight for our families. We need your special protection over our children, our loved ones, our husbands, and whoever it is we consider to be our family. So I give you thanks and I give you praise in your son precious name. Amen. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our praise and worship session. To begin our hymns of praise, we will begin with hymn number 34, Wake the Song.
yes, so yes, we would sing of God's love to us. Good night, everyone. Good night, Karina. Hi, good evening, Jaden, and good evening to all of our viewers online and in person here at Arima SD Church. Oh, oh yes, we welcome you. We wish you a warm Tuesday evening. Welcome. And we are really happy, Karina, for those who took the um who followed our plight to make their way down to the Gan Street. Oh yes. Oh yes, and so we want to say a special good night to all those who are in-house. Um, Brother Brumble, I saw him on the way in. Good evening, Brother Brumble. And my dear friend, Sister Abdul. Um, good oh, evening, yes. Sister Abdul. And we are at that point in time where we do our roll call. Mm -hmm. I know persons were looking forward to this last evening and we saw by the great um, messages in the chat, persons were indicating that they were present. I saw. And guess what? Guess who's here this evening? Tell us. We have Vernie's Lessie. So oh, the Lessies, so they are hot in the chat. Yes. We saw Sister Petronella Augusta, Sister Jennifer Jack, always early. Sister Henrietta Brumble, Donna St. Bernard, and Cordner, Brother Roland Williams made sure and right present and accounted for in the chat. And Sister Sita Abdul, right here in person, she greeted us by the door and said, I am here tonight. <laughs> praise God, praise God. Sister Carol St. Bernard, you're online. I hope you are here. If you are here, just say present because this is our roll call. If you hear your name, remember to type present in the chat. Sister Carol St. Bernard. And you know we wouldn't be able to call everyone's name every single night. No, of you course know. not. This is a random selection. Uh, Sister Keisha Renwick, Angela Francis, Margaret Scipio, my primary school teacher. Mm -hmm. Yes, Ingrid Anderson, Rose Sank, um, Sherry Ann Daniel, Claudia Daniel, Kyle Laroche. Rhoda Daniel, plenty Daniels here, yes. uh, Sarah Torres, and Jennifer Ram Charita. And guess what? I'm hoping that some of these persons that are on this list decide to come down here tonight. But even if you can't make it tonight, Jaden, a little birdie whispered in my oh, ears yes. this evening. Come on, I'm getting Something excited. Something about the hot chocolate. Praise the Lord. It's coming on stream tomorrow. Not on stream, but right here at the Arima State Church. So if you are desirous of having the word of God coupled with some hot chocolate, it will go down nice. Yes, yes. You know, right there, are here many, tomorrow night. there are many things we can share over the, the internet via mm -hmm. this YouTube channel. Unfortunately, hot chocolate isn't one of those oh, things. No. So come right down to the Arima Seventh-day Adventist Church and have sweet fun and fellowship with us. And I think Pastor was saying, um, they can't bus him. <laughs> so no matter how many persons come down tomorrow, Pastor is willing and able yes. and ready to take care of you all, right? I challenge you all to come down to Arima Church and try to bus Pastor on his streets tomorrow night. All right. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So at this time, we want to give you your call to action. You, the digital evangelist online, this is the time where you can get involved, where you can share this link so that it can go through all this world. Mm -hmm. uh, we can get our numbers up even. Share it on YouTube, share it on Instagram, share it on Facebook, share it on WhatsApp. And if you share the link, make sure and put in the chat, shared. So we will know that you have done your part in spreading the gospel. Oh yes, oh yes, and remember again, Turn up the volumes on those devices so that you can have a little mini open air right in your home and maybe even outside of the home as well. All right. So turn up those devices and tune in right here at the Grace Phil Family Series at the Arima Seventh-day Adventist Church. You know, we always receive questions from our participants. And we thought it would be nice if we do something a little different yeah. for a change. Now, we have asked some questions, so we asked you, where is your favorite place to have family recreation? And you said, we take you to the video now. Well, it's not really our place, because as a family, we like to kind of go exploring. So, just go and see where the road takes us. At the beach. Anywhere where there's a pool. The area of Karanach. 
I would say at the beach. At home, at the family table playing games. Off-road and the nylon pool. So there you have it, friends. These are your responses. Off-road or nylon pool, oh, Korea. Yes. And a lot of people said at the beach as well. Oh, yeah. So what's, what's your best place to have, your favorite place to have family recreation? I would say Maracas Beach. Maracas Beach. Yes. Wonderful. So Karina is a beach buddy, just like many of you. And we thank you again for your responses to this question. Um, night after night, we would have a question that we would be airing to hear your response on matters concerning the family. All right. As we speak about matters concerning the family, Tonight's topic is, is singleness better than marriage? Mm. Very interesting topic we have in the world, a current of people saying, you know, I could be single, you know, I, I will be single forever, someone said. Oh my. You know, and persons feel that, you know, marriage is increasingly undesirous. Mm. And so the question is asked and will be answered tonight, is singleness better than marriage? So stay tuned. And even now, we will be blessed with special music by our dear sister, Sister Chelsea Dennis, who will minister to us.
Amen. Amen. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. What a beautiful rendition. And what I particularly liked seeing, Karina, uh, is a um, father and daughter duo. Oh, yes. A father there on the piano. And, and we're dealing with family life this week. Mm -hmm. And Arima Church is, is stopping at nothing. No, it's a practical that. example. Yes, yes, yes. Family life right here at the Arima Seven Day Adventist Church. What a wonderful rendition. Friends, thank you. We are seeing you are sharing it. We are oh, yes. seeing you are sharing it. And we are really appreciative. And I know that heaven is also very appreciative. All of heaven is rejoicing now that yes. persons are sharing this message. And I'm sure someone who needs this message will see it because of the action that you committed to take this evening. So thank you. Thank you. And at this point in time, we move swiftly into our question segment with our dear Pastor Horrell. Good night, Pastor. Good night, Karina and Jaden. Good night. How are you guys tonight? We are Wonderful. good. Why do you look bright? Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> and good night, everyone. The question for this evening is, mm -hmm. Pastor, in speaking about having multiple sex partners, you said that person's brains are rewired and as a result there is no commitment but in this day and age people don't want commitment all people are concerned with is to have fun and to use modern drugs to deal with the consequences please comment well that's true but you know this message is not just for those who don't want to commit. This message is also for others, for the many young ladies out there who are being, you know, fooled by the nice sweet nothings that some of those guys like to whisper in your ears. So the message is for you as well, to make you wise, to see, to let you see through, you know, the, the smoke screen and wise up and realize that the enemy is seeking to destroy your soul. So, be on the lookout. The message is not just for those who don't want to commit. Hopefully they will understand God's love for them. But it's particularly for those who need God's protection, those who love the Lord and want to respect their bodies as his temple. Amen. Amen. So it's the message is for those who would want to respect their bodies as God would have designed. While you may have other competing options, we thank God for his word, which is sure and it will provide that guidance that we need to ensure that we build and enrich our grace filled families. Again, friends, we thank you for being here with us as tonight we are going swiftly into the topic of tonight is singleness better than marriage. Mm -hmm. Are we going to hand over to our praise team shortly uh, and, uh, and other individuals? Um, but we, want, we, we must make mention of those of you who are online. We are really happy that you are here. I just saw Karina that the numbers are about 50 something persons right. who are online and we're aiming to beat last night 80 something and so we encourage you again to just share this message so that someone indeed can be blessed you know I know many times that I'm scrolling through my Facebook news feed and I see a message that someone of my friends may have shared and I click on it and I am blessed in, in turn. And I'm happy that they would have shared it. Oh, yes. Because I received a blessing directly because they would have shared it. And we are encouraging you tonight too to be Make that agent impact. of blessing in someone's life tonight. Amen. So again, we want to thank you for inviting us into your homes. As you invite God into your hearts. Praise him over to you. Thank you. 
Divide the word and that all who listen will understand, will hear your voice speaking to them, and that they will be clear in their minds that you are leading them to follow you. And we praise you and we give thanks. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Is it better to be single than to be married? I'd like us to consider two verses carefully from Ephesians 5, the last two verses of the chapter. Because in these two verses, well, they are the penultimate verses really. But in these two verses, verses 31 and 32, Paul sums up his teaching on marriage. And listen to what he says. He says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So he's talking about marriage, but yet he says, this is a mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Now, I'd like to draw a few points for Paul's teaching on marriage. And my first point is, marriage is not an end in itself, but it was given to us as a sign of Christ's relationship to his church. Let me say that again. Marriage is not an end in itself, but it was given to us as a sign of Christ's relationship to his church. So marriage is not ultimate. It is our sign and shadow of a higher reality. You see, the love we were created for is not the love of another human being. Are you listening to me? We were not created for the love of another human being, but for Christ's love, because he alone is the source of all love and joy. And the church triumphant is the ultimate eternal family. You see, according to scriptures, follow me closely, according to scriptures, relationships in Christ are more permanent 
and more precious than relationships in biological families. Say, Pastor, where you got that from? Well, bear with me as I unpack this. Relationships in Christ are more permanent and more precious than relationships in biological families. You remember that Jesus said in Matthew 22 and verse 30 that in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels of God in heaven. Now, I don't know what our relationships are going to be like in heaven, but I'm pretty certain that they will not be like the relationships we have here. And I'm tempted to let that thought that there'll be no marriage in heaven make me sad. But I'm sure that whatever God has in store for us there will be infinitely better than whatever we have here. If anything, we'll be closer there than here. Now, I don't know exactly how that will work, but the point is that marriage is not eternal or the ultimate relationship. Secondly, you remember on another occasion in Matthew 12, verses 47 through 50, Matthew 12, 47 through 50. Then one said to him, look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak with you. But he answered and said to the one who told him, Who is my mother? And who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Now what a radical statement this was. And I'm sure that Jesus loved his brothers and sisters. But he was saying that biological or blood relationships are only temporary. That's why his focus was on those whom he called out for himself. You see, he was calling out a new family. Hear me now. He was calling out a new family where single people or individuals in Christ are full-fledged family members on par with all the others, bearing fruit for God and becoming mothers and fathers of the eternal kind. Remember he said that his mother and brothers and sisters are those who obey his word. Thirdly, on yet another occasion, in Luke eleven twenty six, Jesus was speaking to a group and a woman yelled out, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. And Jesus turned and said in verse 27, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Wow. Could you imagine this? That those who obey the word of God are more blessed than the mother of Jesus? And then in Mark 10, 29 and 30, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers, or sisters, or mother, or father, or children, or lands, for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses, and brothers, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands, with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. So what is Jesus saying in these references? Jesus was saying that we must renounce the primacy of our natural relationships and follow him into the fellowship of the people of God, whether we are single or married. In other words, we need to take a deep breath and reorder our world because marriage is temporary and it will finally give way to the relationship to which it was pointing all along the relationship between Christ and his bride, the church. Marriage only gives you a sign and foretaste of the future kingdom of God. Now, I don't want to dismiss the importance of the sign because marriage is one of the very best of God's good gifts to us and an indispensable part of the created order. But it is important to understand that life goes wrong when you make the symbol or the sign the ultimate. Life goes wrong. And many a marriage goes wrong when someone believes that their happiness and self-worth are dependent on being loved romantically. 
And then there are so many who are single but are very unhappy because they believe that marriage or good romance is the one indispensable key to being happy. But the belief that romantic love completes us is the most widely accepted myth in our culture and the most widely worshipped false god. You can hear this belief coming through in the lyrics of the popular songs. One such song of yesteryear says, you are the meaning in my life. You are the inspiration. Another says, I can't live if living is without you. In a recent interview, Matt Dillon, an American actor and film director, said that most Hollywood people are relationship junkies. They get a high off a relationship like a drug. So they go from one relationship to the next. And one popular singer has a song that literally says, your love, your love, your love is my drug. But those relationships last just about 18 months, which is how long most psychologists say that it takes an infatuation to wear off. After that, they need a new high, so they move on to a new relationship. But like all drugs, it doesn't work. Because we weren't created to be completed by the love of another human being. We were created to be completed by the love of Christ. That's why lonely, insecure, unhappy single people become lonely, insecure, unhappy married people. The drug of a new relationship fixes it for a while. But then it wears off and leaves you craving for more because problems like loneliness, insecurity, and unhappiness are not cured by the companionship of another human being. They are cured by the love of Christ. It was Gary Thomas in his book, Sacred Search, and he's a family life expert. He says, marriage doesn't solve emptiness. It exposes it. If someone can't live without you, he or she will never be happy living with you. End quote. You see, we weren't designed to meet the deep soul needs of another human being. Life goes wrong when something God intended to point to him starts to compete with him in your heart. So Thomas counsels. He says, marry someone with a solid core who doesn't depend on you to meet his or her deep soul needs, doesn't depend on you to make him or her happy, but is happy in Jesus. You see, marriage goes wrong when you make it the measure of a significant life. Now, many have this assumption that the man or woman who does not leave a permanent family has left no real mark in the world. They are incomplete. They die alone and insignificant. Now, I believe in family, and I enjoy family, but I'm aware, according to scripture, that ultimate family is not biological, it is spiritual. Ultimate family is not produced by procreation, but by regeneration. Are you listening to me? You see, disciples of Jesus are the only offspring that endure forever. Thus, a life that does not produce biological offspring is not a failed life, but a life that does not make disciples of Jesus is a failed life. Of course, the ideal is when your natural family, your biological family, is also part of the permanent eternal family. That's the ideal. And so parents have a responsibility to bring their children to Jesus. That they will come to know Jesus so that they can be part of his ultimate family. So husbands, your wife is your first pastoral responsibility and your children your first mission field because God wants to work through you to bring them into his family. Do you know why God wants that? It's because our biological family is just temporary but the spiritual family, the church, is eternal. And when you understand this, you would never say to someone in an ultimate sense, you complete me. Because you know that it is Christ 
who completes you. Colossians 2.10 says, And you are complete in him, in Christ that is, who is the head of all principality and power. You are complete in him. You see, while marriage is a good and beautiful gift from God, it must never replace in our hearts the thing it symbolizes, which is the relationship between Christ and his church. Now, my second point from the apostles' teaching on marriage is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 7. And I'm using 1 Corinthians chapter 7 quite a lot tonight. 1 Corinthians 7, 7. For I wish that all men were even as myself, as I myself, but each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. Now Paul's point here is that singleness is not an inferior state to marriage. You know, single people sometimes get a raw deal because married people are always trying to fix them up as if something is wrong with them. One young man said he got so sick of the little old ladies in his church who would say to him at each wedding, don't worry, you are next. He finally got them to shut up by saying to them at funerals, don't worry, you are next. <laughs> now, according to Paul, singleness is a gift and marriage is a gift. Yes, that's what he's saying. For I wish that all men were even as I myself, but each one has his own gift from God. And the apostle says that there are some real privileges to being single. And I'll talk about some of them in a while. But let me just acknowledge that sometimes in the church, we talk as if marriage was a superior state. And if you are single, it's because you are lesser mortal. And then some say, the reason you are single is because you're too picky. As though God is frustrated by our narrow criteria for choosing and needs us to broaden them so he can bless us. Now it's true that some are too picky, but that is not entirely why they are single. Yet others say, before you can marry someone wonderful, you must become someone wonderful. But the truth is that all of these statements are based on the premise that a single life is a second class life. A state of deprivation for people not yet fully formed for marriage. But that's not true. Because marriage is not the ultimate life. Look at what Paul says in verses 29 and 30 of 1 Corinthians 7. He says, but this I say, brethren, the time is short, so that from now on, even those who have wives should be as though they had none. Those who weep as though they did not weep. Those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice. Those who buy as though they did not possess. Now, Paul is saying this world is passing away, and along with it, marriage and biological families. So we married people should reflect on the truth that our marriage is not ultimate or permanent. And you single people should reflect on the truth that your situation is not permanent either. Both situations are light and momentary and will soon give way to what is ultimate and eternal, Christ and the church. My third point is both marriage and singleness are temporary gifts God uses for the fulfillment of his purposes. This is found in 1 Corinthians 7, 7. But each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. Notice, both marriage and singleness are called gifts in this verse. And the word the apostle uses for gift is charisma, which literally means spiritual empowerment or a spiritual gift which God gives for the accomplishment for the accomplishment of his purposes in your life. It might be temporary, a special empowerment for a specific time in your life. For others, it might be a calling that lasts your whole life. So maybe God has a special assignment for you that you can only accomplish if you are single or something you need to complete like your education, which you can't do when you are married. Or maybe there are some character things he can only teach you while you are single. 
Or maybe he has called you to demonstrate to your unsaved friends that happiness and contentment are not found in romance, but in God. And you can only do that during this time as someone single. So singleness is a gift. Marriage is also a gift that God gives to some. So it is not yours to decide, but God's to give. Remember, it was God who said, it is not good that the man should be alone. You see, marriage is a gift that teaches you about the love of God. Did you hear what I said? Oh yes, it teaches you about the love of God. It is the means God uses to satisfy some of your desires for companionship, affection, affirmation, and security. Marriage has taught me more about the gospel than anything else. It has showed my need of grace and has showed me how to show grace. And of course, it is the arena God has created for the enjoyment of sexual intimacy and the propagation of the human race. Point number four. Both singleness and marriage are wonderful and they have their advantages, but they also have their drawbacks. Paul says in verses 33 and 20, 34, but the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. You see, single guys, everything changes when you get married. The way you spend your money changes. Marriage is more expensive than singleness. Your social, as, as Jaden, your social life changes. Your recreational life changes. Even your spiritual life changes. And it ought to because marriage is a sanctifying experience. So when a guy says, I, went to get, I want to get married, my response is, do you really want to do that? Are you ready for your life to change that much? And then to the woman, verse 34 says, and the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. You say you want to get married, young lady. Well, here's my question for you. Do you know what men smell like on a regular basis? He is probably not going to eat like you and your girlfriends. He's probably not as excited about stir fry and noodles and eating with a knife and fork. Besides, if you get married and have kids, it's going to affect your career, whether you are a husband or a wife. For many of you, it may stymie your career altogether. You see, the freedom of a single person to pursue things, both career-wise and otherwise, is astounding. Now, I don't want to take anything away from being married. Marriage is my gift. I enjoy being married. In fact, I wouldn't be half the man I am or the minister I am, if I wasn't a husband or a father. The things that God has done and is doing in my life through these roles is amazing. He is shaping me and molding me and pruning me in order to make me more like Jesus. Oh yes. And sometimes that shaping and molding and pruning makes you uncomfortable. Oh yes, it does. Because, you know, basically we all like to have our own way, right? But I have learned that it's not my way. It's our way. Hello, are you there? So God is working on me through the gift of marriage to make me more like Jesus. Point number five. Single people should get married only if they have the gift of marriage. So the question is, how do you know if you have the gift? And the first part of the answer is found in verse 9, where it says, for it is better to marry than to burn. It is better to marry than to be aflame with passion. In other words, if you are not good at keeping your virginity, then you should work toward getting married. If you are aflame with passion, when you look at a girl and you think she's hot, or you look at a man and you are aflame with passion for him, ask God for the gift of a spouse so you can have an easier time being holy. Now Paul, who had the gift of singleness, describes himself like this in verse 37. He says, but whoever is firmly established in his heart, being under no necessity, but having his desire under control, he will do well. 
if that describes you, then you've probably got the gift of singleness, at least for the time being. And you should take advantage of it. But if you are not like that, ask God for a spouse. The second part of the answer to the issue of getting married is, is it time? Sometimes you may feel like you want to get married, but it evidently is not God's will because a suitable person is not in your life or circumstances dictate that it's not the right time. Look at what Paul says in verse 26. He says, I think that in view of present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Now, what was he talking about? You see, Paul was writing in a particular era of history when persecution against Christians was reaching fever pitch. Christian families were being torn apart, sold into slavery, and butchered in the arenas. It was difficult enough to go through persecution as a single person. But if you were married, your troubles multiplied. So Paul's counsel was, during this time, if you are not married, it's probably better to just remain single. Now that was then. But we are not now in that same situation. So what does it mean for us? I believe that Paul would encourage marriage in our context more. But what it certainly means is that there can be a present situation in your life that makes it more advantageous for you to wait. Like if you have not yet completed your education, or if you are trying to get established in your career, or maybe you need healing from something in your life, or you accepted a call to mission assignment. You see, there are times when marriage would hinder some of the good things that God wants to do in your life. And if that is the case, take advantage of this chapter in your life and don't look at it as a curse. It was Paige Benton Brown in her book, Singled Out by God for Good. She wrote, and I quote, I am not single because I am too spiritually unstable to possibly deserve a husband or because I am too spiritually mature to possibly need one. I am single because God is so abundantly good to me because this is his best for me. Point number six. Don't squander one blessing by coveting another that you're not ready for. You know, I think of David when he was in the pasture looking after his sheep. It was an unheard of thing to be called to be king while being in the pasture taking care of sheep. Some of you feel called to be married, but you feel you are in the pasture of singleness. Well, that may be good news because some of God's best blessings come while you are in the pasture. You remember it was in the pasture that David learned to worship. That's where he developed courage and faithfulness. If you are single, don't sit around and wonder, when is God going to bless me? He is blessing you. Singleness is part of the blessing. It's your pastor time. David would never have been the king he was, the man after God's own heart, without that pastor time. You don't have to wait to start your life. Get going with what God is doing. If you are called to be single for a time, he will enable you to be single for that time. And when and if God does bring along that person, he will likely do it, not because you were obsessed about it, but because you focused your attention on what God was doing and got busy doing it. Remember Matthew 6.33. It says, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added. In the context, all these things would include marriage. Point number seven, when it's time, don't wait. I love what Paul says in verse 36. If anyone thinks that he is not behaving properly toward his betrothed, if his passions are strong and it has to be, let him do as he wishes, let them marry, it is no sin. If it has to be, get married. Whatever you do, do it boldly. I have a special word from the Holy Spirit for some of you single guys. Make up your stuttering mind. Don't string her along. Don't get engaged to her with an elusive promise of marriage in the not too distinct future. And show some confidence because girls don't want a wishy-washy guy. And if it's not time to get married, as in you don't have a job, then quit flirting with her. 
Quit leading her on and get on with what God is doing in your singleness. And now a word to the young ladies. You too must not lead the guy on. Dating is a road that leads to the destination of marriage. And if you're not ready for the destination, stay off the dating road. My point is, when it's time to wait on God, wait. And when it's time to act, act with boldness, strength, and courage. Now, guys, if she says no, then leave her alone. And don't rush to drop the marriage card on your first date. Godliness and confidence should never be confused with silliness. Point number eight. Reject the e-harmony myth. You know, e-harmony is a website which helps to match you with other singles who are compatible with you. Now, there's nothing wrong with e-harmony. But the myth says that if you can just find the perfect person, you will have the perfect marriage. And so you're almost paralyzed trying to find Mr. Perfect or Miss Perfect. That's because we believe in the Hollywood version of romance and marriage. Every romantic movie has the same plot. The life story begins just as two people are about to meet each other. And they realize everything in their lives has been leading them up to this point. After a couple of meetings and dates, they have a romantic affair where they find true love. And once they do, the story fades out. The message is clear. Life begins and ends by finding romance. But there is no perfect person. And if you think you have found the perfect person, check their hands. And unless those hands are nail scarred, their perfection is just an illusion, which you will see through after about 18 months, which is how long it takes for unrealistic infatuation to wear off. Think about this. The person you are so into was so bad that Jesus had to die for them. Something in them was so bad that it took the blood of Jesus to fix it. So you think that it's not going to cause some problems in your marriage? If it was bad enough for Jesus to die for, it's probably going to cause you some mild irritation at least. Here's the point. Because you idolize marriage, you are trying to find the right person. Terrified you will marry the wrong one. Or you are married, or if you are married, you are miserable thinking you married the wrong one. The e-harmony myth says that happiness in marriage depends on finding the perfect match. But it's not the incompatibility that makes for a happy marriage. It is God's grace. The point in marriage is not to make you happy by finding the perfect soulmate, but to make you holy by teaching you to love like Jesus. The point of marriage is to learn to wash the feet of another sinner, one who sins against you and disappoints you and betrays you. Oh yes, you have to learn to wash that person's feet. And I don't mean it necessarily in the literal sense, but I mean you have to bear with them, confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that you may receive healing from God. Point number nine. Never settle for just anyone. Verse 39 tells you to marry only in the Lord. Did you get that? Never marry an unbeliever or someone who is not walking strongly in Jesus. Some young ladies, when they reach their late 20s and into their 30s and 40s, unmarried, they freak out thinking that they've got to find a guy. So any guy will do. Any married person will tell you that it is more miserable to be married to an unsuitable person than to be single. Remember, this guy is going to be the biggest influence on your children, who will be more important to you than anything else on earth in the ways of God. Don't settle for a guy who won't lead them spiritually. One final word to singles. God promises you blessings in the age to come that are better than the blessings of marriage and children. Now, I am not sentimentalizing singleness to make those who are not married feel good. I am declaring the temporary and secondary nature of marriage and family over against the eternal and primary nature of the church. Marriage and family are temporary for this age. The church is forever. 
I am declaring the radical biblical truth that being in a human family is no sign of eternal blessing. But being in God's family means being eternally blessed. And if your family belongs to God, hallelujah, then it means that they will be permanent as well. Relationships based on union with Christ are eternal. Marriage is a temporary institution, but what it stands for lasts forever. So renounce the primacy of your natural relationships and follow Jesus into the fellowship of the people of God. I say it again to all singles in Christ. God promises you blessings in the age to come that are better than the blessings of marriage and children. Marriage is temporary and finally gives way to the relationship to which it was pointing all along, the relationship between Christ and this church. Get this, marriage is not ultimate. It is just a sign, a symbol of something ultimate, the marriage between Christ and this church. You know when you're planning to get married to someone who is especially nice, you think you're going to have a marriage made in heaven. But one of these days, soon, we are going to have a marriage made in heaven. Then we're going to be married to the perfect spouse. Do you know who that is? Jesus Christ. And do you know something? This one will be forever. Hallelujah. We'll enjoy eternal bliss, eternal joy and happiness. We'll be in love forever. So if you think you are happy here, you ain't see nothing yet. Then all the happiness that I dreamed about and had only faint and periodic glimpses of will be realized there. Then and only then will we be able to sing, glory for me, glory for me. Oh, that will be glory for me. And I'm really looking forward to that. Are you? I wonder how many of you are looking forward to that. You are looking forward to the ultimate permanent marriage, the marriage of the Lamb, when Jesus comes, returns for his church. Oh, yes. So God wants us to follow him into his kingdom because it is only his followers who will last for eternity. So lead your family to Jesus, that they will be part of God's eternal family. And so they will last forever with Jesus. So, do you want to be in that number that will shout, oh, that will be glory for me? Do you? And you just want to stand to your feet where you are and say, Jesus, have mercy on me. I want to be ready to receive that ultimate glory. I want to be ready to be married to you. In the marriage of the Lamb, when you come, to take the church triumphant into your kingdom. Holy Father, thank you for your people who are here tonight and those who are online listening. May every one of us desire that glory, that eternal glory. May we not idolize the symbol, the sign, but may we remember what it points to. And may we keep that ever before us so that day by day, we can follow you all the way until we see you when you return for your bride. We will be a part of your family then. May this be a reality for all of us because we pray and we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Thank you very much. God bless you.
Praise the Lord. Amen. Oh, yes. We thank God for his word this evening from his manservant, Pastor Cyril Horrell, for once again blessing us is singleness better than marriage. And I like the quote that says, do not look at singleness as a curse. It is a gift from God. Some of your best blessings come in the pasture of singleness. And this evening, we had over 90 viewers. Jaden, the viewers are indeed making us very proud, won't you say? Indeed, indeed they are. And we had our viewers, Aniela, Vanessa, Caicedo Castro. You have got to come down here at Arima SDA to let us know if we are pronouncing your name correctly. Sister Keisha Renwick. Yes, we had Akisha, Akul, Claudia, Daniel, Berth, Thomas, Sheila Leibert, Shamsha Dukan. Good evening to you. Carleen Elms, Ola Copeland. Vanessa Thompson, Karen and Glenda Romeo, Avalyn Douglas, Shauna Thompson, Meryl Dennis, Andre Batiste. Oh yes, again we thank you for coming out and joining us tonight at the Arima Seventh-day Adventist Church. Be sure to come out tomorrow night. We thank you again, as Karina mentioned, for uh, sending up the numbers to 90 plus tonight. And we want to tip it another over 100, another 10 over 100 tomorrow. And we want to see this place filled as well uh, tomorrow. Remember, we have our treats tomorrow. Uh, so please remember to come down for Pastor's Hot Chocolate. And remember, the topic for tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock is a biblical perspective on marriage. So again, we want to thank you for inviting us into your homes. As you invite God into your hearts. Good night.
Thank you.